Thank you for joining us on this live stream here at the Lambda YouTube page. Today's presenter is Nate Johnson. He debated at the University of Kansas, where he was a 2009 NDT champion and the 2008 CETA finalist. In high school, he was a Kansas State champion as well and is currently an environmental attorney at Alston Bird in downtown LA. And though he will be departing this summer to pursue a political career in his home state of Kansas, for the past five years, Nate has proudly served on the Lambda Board of Directors and coached for Downtown Magnets. He sincerely appreciates this opportunity to speak with you. And with that, the floor is his. Thank you very much, Joseph. And thank you everybody uh, who took the time to listen today. I am very grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak with you, especially as my career with Lambda is winding down. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about a topic that is very uh, near and dear to my heart, a little broader than some of the topics that will be to follow, but I'd like to focus today on the art of debate, thinking about how we persuade people through debate and the communication that we do. Uh, I think this, again, very broad, starting in a very broad way, uh, is incredibly important to us as debaters, but also as members of our community. Uh, in debate, sometimes we hear about portable skills, things that we learn in debate that we can take with us that are portable outside of a competitive debate setting. And I think broadly learning how to persuade people is an exceptionally important part of debate that translates incredibly well to our communities and just being a part of the world outside of debate. So thank you everybody for being here as I talk about that today. Uh, there are gonna be two components to my lecture broadly speaking again. The first is rhetoric. We're gonna talk about how to persuade people, not only in a debate setting, but thinking in a more general way as well. Then I would like to focus in on the language of debate, how we talk in debate, how we communicate to one another in a debate round and outside as well. To be able to persuade people, you have to be able to speak a language that they understand and that is compelling to them. Being able to understand the basics of debate is essential to becoming good at debate and then learning the skills that translate outside of it as well. I also would like to start by discussing briefly why I call it the art of debate and not the science of debate. I think it is an art because what we're trying to do is translate our personal understanding of some situation or experience into an objective meaning. We're trying to use our interpretation of the way the world is to persuade someone else to see it the way that we do. We're moving from our subjective experience into objective meaning to get other people on our side, to get political movements going, to try to have our family work together better. All of this is a part of persuasion that isn't necessarily scientific. At the same time, we use scientific tools as with any art we need to understand the history, the empirical nature of what we're doing. We need to hypothesize about new ideas and experiment with those ideas. But when I say that it is not a science, I mean that we're not necessarily operating in objective rules that work the same for every single person that is in competitive debate, especially more broadly again, in rhetoric and persuasion in our communities in general. We're talking about artistry, not necessarily science, although science of course is important. Let's start then with the art of persuasion and rhetoric. Uh, rhetoric is just that, and it was defined by Aristotle as the art of persuasion. And that's how we're gonna talk about it as well. Before moving any farther though, I'd like to emphasize that it is the art of persuasion that is focused on a particular audience. If you're in a debate room and you're debating another team and you have a judge that is incredibly familiar with debate, the language you are going to use the appeals you are going to use, the logic you're going to use is gonna be entirely different than if you had a judge that isn't necessarily as involved in debate, that doesn't know nearly as much about debate itself, our language, our own internal logic. Outside of a debate, we have to use a different type of appeal, a different sort of logic, a different kind of style if we're talking to our community. We love talking as quickly as possible as we can oftentimes of debate, and it does allow us to push the boundaries of argumentation and logic, but that can only work 
if we're speaking to an audience that understands speaking at a quick pace. Otherwise, we need to tailor our whole persuasive approach, our entire rhetorical approach to the audience that we have. It's really important in debate, especially as you progress from novice through junior varsity into varsity. You're gonna experience a lot of different judges and through your life, you're gonna experience a number of different audiences. Being able to adapt is one of the more important parts that we learn, pieces of debate that we learn. As I mentioned, I'm gonna focus on rhetoric in an Aristotelian perspective from Aristotle. You'll notice a lot of these come from old white dudes, though he's especially white because I think he's in marble here. Aristotle came up with the three modes of persuasion that again, I will focus on today. We're familiar with those, ethos, pathos, logos, ethos meaning credibility of the speaker, pathos, more emotional appeals, and logos, which we're very familiar with in debate, which is logic. At the same time, while this is a very traditional framework, I really like that all three parts are as important to the mode of persuasion, the ultimate mode of persuasion, as all of the other parts. Oftentimes, in debate in particular, but you know, just in general when we're talking about things like policy, logic, science, data, come to overwhelm other issues such as credibility or pathos and feeling and emotional appeals. And I want to push us all to think a little bit more radically about the different parts of the triangle, the different pieces of persuasion that help us work with others. At the same time, there are of course different ways of understanding persuasion. Another old Western version is the Roman one from Cicero. He split it up into five different canons of rhetoric. Uh, same sort of stuff, similar concepts, a lot of overlapping material, but you know, a different catalog, especially for the type of argument that occurred in Rome. We've got invention, arrangement, how we put the arguments in order, a big part of debate as well. We have our own unique constructives, rebuttals, speech orders, this and that. And if it's not arranged appropriately, you're just not persuasive. Elocution or style, everybody needs to develop their own style. That's a big part of pathos, as we'll talk about in a bit. Memory, in Rome, you didn't write things down as often as memorize your arguments. In debate, we rely very heavily on the evidence that we have already before us and memory isn't quite as important. At the same time, the better you know your arguments, the better you're gonna be able to argue. Delivery also important beyond just style is the type of delivery that occurs. Are you in a setting that requires very strict rote procedural delivery such as a courtroom setting? Or are you in a debate with a judge that allows you to be a lot more freeform and creative in a way that you can take advantage of? As I mentioned though, all of this kind of depends on you. The art of persuasion is practiced differently by each and every person. We don't even necessarily have to rely on Western modes of persuasion from Romans and Greeks, although I think it's a very useful way of considering how we persuade, especially since we do live in a world dominated by Western modernity, Western thought, Western persuasive techniques. Knowing how to persuade in that style of thinking is incredibly important in our world. It just is. At the same time, I push you all to really think about different ways that rhetoric can occur, different ways that you can persuade. What are ways in your life maybe that don't fit within pathos, ethos, logos, that you persuade people to do things differently for a positive outcome for yourself, your family, or your community? All of us need to think about how we persuade to do it as effectively as possible. At the same time, we do have tools. And that the three tools or modes of persuasion that Aristotle provided, or at least wrote down, are the ones that I want to talk about here in the context of debate. Ethos. How do we develop our credibility in debate? I try to break this down into three different parts, although they meld into one another, they overlap significantly, and it's all part of a continuous process of establishing your credibility. So first, we've got some pre-round ethos. What are you going to do before the debate round to build up your own credibility. We can arrive on time. It's incredibly simple, so straightforward. We maybe don't think about it until we're past time. But if you're in your room 10 to 15 minutes before your round starts, or at least as soon as you get the schedule or pairing, you seem so much more on top of your stuff than if you arrive late. It's not the end of the world if you do, of course. It depends on the tournament, where you are, how long it takes to get from room to room. But in general, even just on the bus before going to the debate tournament, do your absolute best 
to arrive on time. Show respect to your partner, to your teammates, to your opponents, to the judge, to the people running the tournament. Respect is incredibly important. Lambda is a very large urban debate league, but at the same time, it's still a pretty small community. We all know one another and can know about one another very easily. Show respect to each other and that will develop positive or negative repu reputation for yourself and for your team. To mention, and I wanna emphasize, you need to help the competition, but the competition, right, isn't just your opponents from a different school. Competition can sometimes even include partnerships on your own team that you might be going up against to clear, to go to out rounds, to get speaker awards. Debate is a highly competitive activity. Learning how to work with your competition to make each other better is a very important part of ethos. So once we're in the round, what can we do? Well, we have our materials ready to go. We're not delaying to read the 1AC. We're not making everybody wait on us, right? We need to know how to transfer files. Uh, this one, I think, takes on even greater importance now that we're not all in the same place. We need to know the mechanics of how we work together to debate now digitally. What sorts of video setup do we have? What sorts of Wi-Fi file transfer systems are we using? We need to make sure to have that available and you know, know how to do it. And we've talked to the other side beforehand. So judges aren't waiting on you. You have strong credibility. You also wanna dress appropriately in a debate. Even when we're you know, online or through video, you send a signal about how credible you are based on your dress. Now I wanna be very careful about saying this because so often how we dress is used to police the types of ideas or ways that people are, but we can't pretend as if dressing nice doesn't add credibility to who we are. And think about if you were watching you speak, if you were making, if you were watching you make those arguments, what would you think of your dress? You know, how would that implicate the arguments? You know, do you need to dress a little nicer? Does it have to be a tie or a suit style? Not necessarily, but maybe that's required here. You need to talk to your coaches and you want to, you know, work together as a team to present a unified front as well. So think about how dress sends a signal. And no matter what, dressing up is a big part of argument and persuasion. It has been in just about every culture. So think about what you are presenting in terms of yourself when you're dressed and how people are looking at you. If you want to listen, it's real easy to just be focused on our arguments, but if you listen to the other side and the judge sees you're listening, you'll have great credibility. We also want to be able to speak well. A lot of times folks just start speaking but haven't been doing speaking drills before the tournament or after. If we're warmed up and ready to go, then we'll do much better and have much better credibility. A lot of ums, or pauses make us less credible. We have some post-round ethos as well, just building on listening this time to the judge. We wanna be gracious with whatever results we get. And then afterwards, continue to build our community so we have good credibility. I do also wanna throw in there, uh, I forgot as part of in-round ethos, is to read good evidence and to make solid arguments. A lot of times in a competitive setting, we try to make the sort of shiftiest arguments possible so that the other side can't argue them can't respond to them effectively. And that's you know entirely sound strategy at times, right? But we want to make sure that's all built with good evidence. It's researched well and well thought out arguments to build your own credibility beyond the logic themselves. Next, I wanna talk about pathos in debate. How do we have feeling as part of our persuasion? Not just rationality, not just logic, but feeling. And I think this is maybe the most important component of rhetoric or persuasion. It involves the use of feeling or emotion to compel the audience to act. We all think we're logical. We all think we're rational. We all think that we've got the world figured out and know what consequences are going to occur. But we can't really have a rationality if we all have different rationalities. There are some common ideas we have. We all work together, obviously. We believe certain things and can persuade each other in objective ways, but there's something sort of irrational, right, or emotional, beyond rationality about coming to a new decision, about agreeing with someone when you didn't before. You were logical when you used to think something else. Now you think a new idea. That is not necessarily a rational process. It involves feeling and emotion. So beyond just using powerful language or talking louder, having a way to compel people to act 
is vitally important to any type of persuasion. How can we do that in debate? Well, you know, styles of evidence is a really important part and a very modern contemporary question in debate. What are we using to demonstrate or prove our point? Are we using poetry or is it traditional policy evidence? Are we using songs or talking about nuclear war? Do those things even have to be separate? Can it all be part of the same consideration, right? What is the evidence that we're using and why does it matter? Uh, oftentimes different kinds of evidence, maybe one that doesn't rely so much on strict scientific data can be more meaningful or persuasive. Our method of delivery, sometimes you wanna speak quickly, that can be more emotional. If you have a, you know, in a weird, odd debate setting where we all talk quickly, that can be a very important way of building pathos and being emotional. But maybe you wanna slow down for really important parts as well. Or if you have a different kind of judge, you wanna do that too. We can also use descriptive language, you know, harsher language, or just more emotional terms as well. But pathos is really difficult. It requires us to constantly be practicing from research to speaking to listening. All of that has to occur for us to develop pathos. It's a, if it's an emotional or rational part, it has to be developed more through practice and something that isn't just as consequential from our acts. Now I wanna talk about the logos of debate, the rational argumentation, the thing that we generally think about in terms of debate. Um, there are two types of logic. I think, and you know, maybe there are more ways we can think about what logic means. Uh, the first is as a type of rationality. You know, if X, then Y, or why is my disad better than their advantage? Why is my counter plan better than their solvency? There are rational reasons for that to be true. The second though, is logic as a structure, right? Because debate has its own sort of logic. You have to present arguments in a very specific way. If you don't present those arguments in that way, if you don't follow the logical structure of debate, your arguments aren't as rational. They aren't as persuasive. So you have to do your best to try to fit within the structure of debate and at the same time be creative. Push that structure. Find yourself and who you are and your own sort of rationality and logic. So logo says rationality. Very important part of debate as well because you just have to have arguments that are rational. I like this picture of Stephen Toulmin. He also came up with a really helpful framework for thinking about arguments, especially in terms of debate. And I guess he also taught at USC for a while as well. Uh, Toulmin's model is this, uh, at least in a sort of narrowed down version that's useful for us in debate. First, for any argument, we've got the claim, right? This is the position that we are staking. What are, what is the impact, right? What is the point that we are trying to make in the debate? Maybe the economy is good. That is the claim that we're making for our disadvantage about economic decline. Second, we have data behind that. We've got some examples about the economy doing, well, not so much now, but we have examples of how the economy is doing, testimony about how that's doing, especially statistics and scientific data as well. Then we have a warrant. What is the reason that that data supports our claim? Maybe consumer confidence is falling, but that doesn't mean that the economy is tanking. We have to demonstrate that consumer confidence is important to the economy. That is the warrant connecting the two. And especially for purposes of debate, I want you to always think about, does my argument have a claim and does my argument have a warrant? Every single argument needs to have a claim. What is the point you're trying to make? And then a warrant. What is the reasoning and how is that supported by data? We, as I mentioned, we've also got logos as structure, which is the logic of debate. And this will kind of segue into the language of debate, which provides us a very fundamental understanding of the terms we're using, you know, the stakes of debate, sort of what the ground rules are. We have to understand the internal logic of competitive debate to be able to persuade people. If you don't know what the logic is of any given system, you're not gonna be able to make people change their minds. This comes up a lot for me as a lawyer. If you do not submit your documents appropriately, if you do not abide by the logic of the system, usually called procedural law, you are not going to persuade any, you're not even gonna get your papers into the courthouse. You have to understand the logic of the system that you're working with to be logical. And that's something we can talk about the rest of this lecture. Uh, one thing I'd really like to press, and this is a bit of a soapbox of mine, but in Lambda, I'd really, I'd really like to push all of us to work better on extending arguments 
in a claim and warrant kind of way. What are the best arguments we can make and how do we extend them in a really structured sort of way so the judge can really understand what we're doing and then we can start developing more complex arguments. We have to have a very solid basis to do more complex things. I encourage everybody to try this method, the ECA method, which I took from my friend Gabe Murillo, who coached and debated for a very long time as well. Uh, first, extend our claim. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about, say, like you're in the 2AC, right? And you're on your case debate and you want to extend some arguments real quickly to demonstrate that you have the best case arguments. Let's say you're in the negative block. You need to extend some arguments and then overwhelm the other side with the number of link arguments you have. How are we going to do that in a really structured way? Because we're not just talking about the link arguments, right? The other side will have made impact arguments, uniqueness arguments, other case arguments that we'll have to answer as well in a very structured way. I encourage everybody to do it this way where one, we extend our claim. Why is our argument good? Maybe the economy is declining now. That is the claim that we are extending. Then we want to compare warrants, meaning why is our warrant good? Maybe we've got a warrant related to consumer confidence and that is the best warrant right now because that is the most reflective indicator of the economy as a whole. You want to answer their warrants. Why is their warrant about the economy being fine bad? You know, there's the pandemic right now, but in more traditional kind of debate settings, right? We can talk about maybe GDP indicators or yeah, other warrants like business confidence. Um, and maybe we can answer consumer confidence, you know, and just build up and answer their warrants to say why theirs are bad. Finally, we just want to add warrants ourselves. In debate, a lot of times it's easiest to vote for one side or the other because they just have more reasons why their arguments are good. Think about what it's like to judge in a debate. It's really, really difficult. You all are very smart. You come up with very good arguments. You present them in persuasive ways. And then we have to decide based on what, like an hour and a half of all of you speaking in equal amounts, who made the best arguments. Oftentimes they're arguments you've had before. So you all understand them so well, and we have to come up with ways to judge and decide who won the debate. If you can make that easier for the judge, you'll have so much more competitive success. And an easy way to do that in debate is to have more warrants than the other side. If you have three warrants, why your claim is correct, they've only got one, it's a really easy calculation for the judge. That sets us up for the language of debate, which I'll try to get through relatively quickly, but these are terms we all kind of hopefully know a little bit, and just to provide us a refresher, sort of a fundamental basic kind of thing for the rest of our lectures in this series, which will explore more uh, complex or advanced topics. Maybe not complex, I wanna sell myself short, I guess. <laughs> uh, so we've got mechanics of debate, and uh, I might miss some things as well. I've tried to include everything as much as I can. We've got overlap here and there. Uh, please feel free to ask either here or during this lecture, or you can send me an email or, you know, You've got teammates as well who can help with all of these pieces. But speech orders, right? We've got first affirmative constructive, first negative constructive, all the way through second negative rebuttal and the second affirmative rebuttal. Constructives, we try to read new arguments, new evidence in rebuttals. Typically, we try to slow down a little bit, frame everything, not read as much new evidence. We have cross-examination. Everybody asks each other questions. That's what makes this type of debate so unique and to me kind of meaningful. Oftentimes, I see debaters not be as involved in cross sex as they should be. And I'll admit I was that way uh, as well. I wasn't all that great at cross sex, even though it is the one time you are directly interacting with the other side and can ask them questions and press them on things right in front of the judge. And it's really important to think about cross-examination, prepare for it and have good questions. Prep time. What do we do before? Make sure you check uh, before our speeches. How are we going to use our prep time? What speeches is it good to use prep time on? How much do we have? Make sure you check the rules of each tournament before going in. Uh, our documents and evidence, we all have evidence. We highlight it. We need, ev we need uh, authors, citations, and make sure, again, you're following the rules of the league that you're in. So you're sharing evidence appropriately and it's out there for everybody. If everybody's sharing evidence, we do so much better in debate. Um, you have judges as well. Uh, I think it'd be good if you haven't before to kind of check out what a ballot looks like, to see what judges are deciding, to maybe check out the Lambda judge training program to see, you know, what are judges deciding? How are they deciding? What are they learning? Uh, so you can persuade them better. 
another thing too is a podium, which is so simple a lot of times, but with computers now um, and not necessarily having desks <laughs> that they fit on, well, a lot of times we need to think of how are we gonna set up a podium to speak in a very persuasive way so that we don't drop our computer <laughs> as well. Some terms for debating, affirmative versus negative. One thing I like to say, it's the job of the affirmative to affirm the resolution. That's the job of the affirmative. The job of the negative is to defeat the affirmative. The negative doesn't have to negate the resolution necessarily. All they're trying to do is negative the affirmative, negate the affirmative. So try to think about that when you're thinking about what you're trying to do as the negative side. We gotta learn to flow, right? Flowing is an incredibly important part of debate too. I wasn't all that great at it. Wish I'd had some more drills as well. One you can do is to take a deck of cards, 52 cards, and then read them as if they are cards in a debate. So your one AC can be the eight of hearts, the four of clubs, the five of diamonds, and then you can switch to some off case positions and on case, and then answer proceeding throughout the rest of the debate. Uh, speeding, spreading, uh, I think we're all probably pretty familiar with it, but in debate, we tend to speak more quickly. We're more familiar with the concepts and the idea is if there's familiarity and we increase the rate of speed, we can increase just the amount of intellectual benefits that we get from the activity. Sometimes though, speed can be a negative thing. It can be used to gloss over less effective arguments. Blocks. We put those together so that we don't necessarily have to write out our arguments every single time in debate. They need to be short, they need to be efficient. And when you have something like a 2AC or a 2NC block to answer arguments that you're super used to, read through them when you're doing speed drills. Read through them when you're practicing beforehand, right? Because you wanna know how long they are. You need to know how long your blocks are if you're gonna be able to use them while in debate. Overviews as well. We use these a lot more in rebuttals. Um, sometimes people use overviews during the constructives. They can get a little long, a little tedious. Make sure when you read an overview at the top of your speech that you have a reason to do it. What is the purpose of this overview? Try to frame everything for the judge. Let's go through some affirmative arguments. We've got stock issues, right? It's traditionally, that's solvency, harms, inherency, and significance. But debate is usually now in terms of cost-benefit analysis or criticisms. So we focus more on what are the advantages of the affirmative? Does it solve those advantages? Is there a plan or advocacy statement for the affirmative? What is it that the, other, that the affirmative team is asking the judge to do? And there are a lot of theoretical questions that come up on the affirmative, which I'll mention briefly uh, when I talk about specific arguments in a moment. So negatives have on-case positions. On-case means they directly attack the arguments that the affirmative made. Off-case positions usually then are separate sheets of paper that we flow on, um, a whole new sort of argument in the debate that is off the case. Off-case positions include topicality, is the affirmative within the bounds of the resolution, disadvantages, are there problems that the affirmative didn't think of, counterplans, and critiques. So topicality, is the affirmative plan within the confines of the resolution? A topicality argument has to have an interpretation not just a definition of a word, but what is your interpretation of the resolution? A violation, how the affirmative doesn't fit within it, some reasons to prefer that interpretation, and then why it's a voting issue. I like voting issues of fairness and education. Fairness and education. There's a ton of other ones, people bring them up, but debate to me tends to come down to whether we're establishing a fair system and whether we're establishing an educational one. Uh, affirmative teams can respond by saying, we meet your interpretation. You know, we are topical. We have a different interpretation, a counter interpretation that is a better interpretation of the resolution and we have reasons to prefer it as well. Also, you know what our argument is. We're reasonably topical. If you care about fairness and education, we should focus more on that than just on focusing on topicality, which is just more arguing about words. Then, you know, which I really enjoy having become a lawyer. But at the same time, reasonability is a very important part of debate because we do want to focus on the substance. Substance can include things like disadvantages. A disadvantage has uniqueness. What is the status quo? What is the state of the world? The reason we call it uniqueness is if the world is good right now, the affirmative causes the world to be bad, we say the affirmative uniquely causes the world to be bad. The world wasn't going to be bad in the first place. 
The link is how the affirmative causes the disadvantage, what is the consequence of the plan. An internal link is a connection between that consequence and an impact. A lot of times in debate, we'll talk about things like nuclear war, also environmental destruction, other things stemming from economic collapse. Too. Disadvantage answers, answer those specific components. We've got offense and defense. Offense where we make the disadvantage into an advantage for the affirmative defense where we just answer the pieces. We can say, hey, it's not unique. The economy's not doing great right now. That's not our fault. It's not a disadvantage, no link. We don't undermine the economy. No impact, there's no real direct impact to economic collapse. It's all just other sorts of things that we need to deal with separately. Or you can maybe say your affirmative increases the economy, helps the economy out. Or you can say, you know, we don't care about economic impacts. We need to abandon that. It's good that we uh, create economic decline. Uh, some other ones that we have too, we've got counter plans. Uh, there's a variety of different counter plans. You can change the agent. You can have a whole different way of solving. You can have counter plans that are then that have a status, right? They can be unconditional. The negative has to read them the entire way through the debate, or you can get rid of the counter plan at any time because you're the negative side. Uh, a counter plan has to have a text. It has to have some solvency, and it has to have a net benefit over the affirmative. When you read a counter plan, such as switching to say the executive, when the affirmative uses Congress. Your net benefit would be using Congress has these negative consequences. Thus, using the president has a net beneficial effect. A lot of times comes up in politics, but every counter plan has to have a net beneficial reason to vote for it. Affirmatives might respond, hey, we can do both of these ideas at the same time. That's what a permutation is. A permutation is a combination of two different ideas. You can say the counter plan doesn't solve our affirmative or it makes the situation worse. You can say they don't actually have a net benefit or the net benefit applies to both the counter plan and the affirmative plan. You can read a variety of theory arguments as well. Why should the negative just get to kick a counter plan when the affirmative doesn't get to kick their plan? These are questions that come up in terms of theory for counter plans. Uh, same sorts of things for critiques as well. Very similar to a disadvantage and a, uh, a counter plan put together in more of a philosophical criticism. Uh, the link. This is very important, right? Because it's not what the consequence of the plan is. I'd like to emphasize a link for a critique is how does the affirmative entrench, entrench a dangerous ideology? The affirmative doesn't cause capitalism, but the affirmative entrenches capitalism by relying on capitalist logic. What is the implication to that reliance, that entrenchment of capitalism, and what is an alternative to that? Affirmatives can respond, hey, we don't really cause capitalism or, and we don't even like make it that much worse. In fact, we're trying to make people's lives better. So we're a net benefit. Maybe there's no real impact to capitalism either or more importantly, there's no real alternative so that we can get there. You could even say, hey, our plan's a pretty good idea. We could do it with a criticism of capitalism. We can all go on the same path right now. You can also read theory arguments to answer a criticism as well. So that's all I've got. Uh, my introductory lecture to the art of debate. Thank you very much, everybody, and happy to answer questions that you have. Awesome. Thanks, Nate, for your presentation. And we've had a few dozen folks checking in. So uh, we've been collecting some of the questions that folks had for you. First one, what are some bad debate habits you had uh, that you had to change when you went to law school and became an attorney? Some of them are not related to your presentation, but they are about your experience. And I'm not seeing any questions yet or hearing them from anybody, but maybe in just a second, thank you. Hey, Nick, can you hear me? All right, and I think maybe it's on my end. Apologies for that. Um, tried to switch my speakers. Maybe I can hear questions now. Can you hear me now? 
Yes. Yeah. Sorry about go. that, Joseph and everybody. My apologies. <laughs> Too hey, much no happening worries. over here. <laughs> so we had some questions coming in from a couple of places. Um, some of them are related to your presentation. Some of them aren't. First one that I wanted to ask was, what are some bad debate habits that you had to change when you went to law school and became an attorney? Oh, yeah. I wasn't thinking about that today or anything at all. <laughs> so <laughs> debate does teach us some very difficult habits that are important to break. Um, I think maybe the first is debate is really important to a lot of us and we learn quite a bit, but at the same time, other people have learned really important ways to think about the world, to think about policy, and to think about argument. Um, so one thing that I had to do in law school was give room for that sort of, you know, rationality or logic or persuasion, um, and just not thinking that policy debate's the best way to think about everything. Um, second, I think a lot of people take the way that you speak in debate, especially speaking really quickly, um, and then try to use that style outside of debate. So we need to think a lot about slowing down or changing our speech patterns, depending on who we're talking to um, as well. But at the same time, debate was also incredibly useful for law school, being able to think quickly and think in terms of claim, warrant, logical structures, rationality, different perspectives, listening to people, uh, made law school much easier uh, than it probably would have been otherwise. But, and you know, the competitive side of it actually makes it a little easier being uh, at law school as well. Um, but we can think that sometimes we're the best debaters or the best kind of persuaders. Um, so stepping back sometimes and listening to others can be valuable as well. Awesome. Another question we had, this one more so, in your from your presentation. Um, going back to when you were talking about topicality, some of the questions are about how do we understand fairness and how do we know what is fair for who? Or how do we determine how, how we prioritize fairness? What yeah, no, I love this question. <laughs> and uh, I have a topicality lecture that's almost explicitly devoted to this topic alone. But I think a really important question and something that's come up a lot more just in my time in debate is fairness for whom, right? Or what even is fairness in the first place? We talk about setting up a theoretical framework for debate, having a really good system, right? Like a strong logic that provides a fair system for everybody to debate and an educational system. Education, you know, we can have in-round, we can have out-of-round education. That's a little easier to conceptualize. I think sometimes fairness though, what does it mean to have a fair debate? And then what does it mean to establish fair debate generally? Um, I think fairness in any given debate is a really particular question. I think as long as teams are, you know, like kind of topical and generally try to apply or think about the resolution, then you're somewhat fair. But like fairness, is really kind of also in the eye of the beholder because just because you're kind of fair doesn't mean that you're necessarily fair enough for the other side to be able to debate. And the difficult part is coming up with how another side uh, forecloses your ability to debate. So we need to think about sometimes maybe if a team doesn't abide by the resolution or follow the resolution, what sorts of arguments wouldn't we be able to read so we wouldn't be able to talk about the resolution, maybe it's important to talk about the resolution in one way or the other. On the flip side though, right, you could say, hey, we're fair enough, we're talking about the resolution, and this idea that we need to be fair to them is often a way that uh, maybe say like oppressors keep out certain voices from other people, right, by establishing lines of fairness. So in terms of topicality, it really kind of depends then on uh, the type of debate you're having, whether it's a policy debate, whether you're debating a more critical team, what does fairness mean in terms of maybe fairness means the number of disadvantages you can read. Maybe fairness though means more of an out of round concept as well. Maybe we should be coming up with arguments that make it so that certain sizes of schools can debate once can debate better or not. Maybe we need to be coming up with arguments that make it easier for schools with less of a budget to debate. In Landall, we have certain evidence restrictions and things like that that make it so that everybody has an equitable playing field. 
So maybe fairness isn't you get to read all the arguments you want, but one that establishes equity uh, between different teams in different schools. But really, you got to come up, I think, a lot of times with your own idea of what you think a fair debate round looks like and what debate should fairly look like and try to translate that into your arguments about topicality or framework. Awesome. And I definitely agree with a lot of that. Let me pull up our next question. From the chat, Cuban asks, how were you able to manage your time between college and being competitive in debate? Uh, so I mean, clearly that's, that's about, about it. it. Um, I, I was, was lucky, lucky where I was able to get some money. money. I'm so I'm sorry, to work all, all the time. time. I would help especially when the media here when we got around a lot. Gordon Wharton check was for schools beforehand before 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 I mean, it's a very, very kind of bad effect. It takes a significant amount of time. And it's, and it's not online like we're working in a lot of different ways, 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 especially in the way. way. Uh, uh, so, so, so coming, coming up with ways, ways to fill in when you can't work, work all the time, time is really, really, really important, important, important to make sure that you have a stable source of income. I mean, it's just hard for day to day to worry about food or anything like that. I don't know if you're all of these things are going to be out. I don't know if you're going to be on your uh, the, the second, second thing is that, that you really, really need to work, work with your professors, your teachers, your community advisors, and, advisors, advisors, uh, and, tell, and tell them that you're part of the debate team. Everybody, everybody likes the debate team for the most part. Maybe you'll be on a professor. So you're kind of bad about it on some time. There's no time to do the debate team and students in this place. So that's why I laugh at them. Right, right. Like, do you really go to the ring? Why do you want to be as a class? Do you want to look for the best rest of your class? Do you help also see the best rest of So, if you have to teach it, you're in the ring with the best rest of your class. And it's much more difficult to beg for forgiveness and ask for permission. So, like, think in that head. Clearly, that you know, you know, the line line investors and teachers who so they, they know, know what they're doing. Cool. Sorry, Luke. Uh, sorry, Nate. We're having a little bit of mic issues. Um, you're sounding a little crunchy. Not sure. Oh, sorry. That. that better? better. Let, me, let me see if it's a Zoom thing or if it's a you thing. All right, I think you're back. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, this work computer just <laughs> does not like new things. There's too much security <laughs> on it. Must have just got a little freaked out by my mic. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, but it seems like you cleared it up a little bit. I think giving it a break, uh, too much knowledge coming through that, <laughs> through that end. Hasn't been used this long before, that's for sure. <laughs> um, is there any part that I need, or part where I cut out or anything like that? Um, kind of just that whole last question. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So debating in college, very difficult to do. <laughs> and a uh, second opportunity, maybe I can be a little bit more efficient. The first is that you've got to have like money kind of, um, and it's tough because you're on your own, right? You've got rent and food and things to take care of that you didn't necessarily take care of on your own before, at least in the uh, degree that you are now. Um, school can be expensive. You need to look ahead and think about financial aid or scholarship opportunities through debate. Debate is a lot like an act athletic activity where especially in terms of missing school um, and missing work opportunities and being able to fill in sort of like income and have a stable sort of life, right? And you're on the move all the time. So try to think ahead and have some money in place or make sure you've got a job that gives that sort of flexibility. The second is to work with your professors, teachers in the same sort of way. You're gonna miss a lot of class um, and that's fine. Teachers, professors love debaters. Debaters are more interactive, tend to do better, come with new ideas and talk in class, which doesn't always happen. Uh, but if you miss a test, right, you're gonna be very hard pressed to get back on that. In this case, it's much easier to um, ask for, for forgiveness, or sorry, to ask for permission than beg for forgiveness. So just try to keep everybody up to date. A lot of times too, like your debate coaches will know many of the professors, you'll have like a piece of paper or form that you can give out to everybody. But if you wanna debate in college, be very realistic about how much time it takes and commit that much time. 
I think it's very valuable, opens up so many doors. Uh, but you get, yeah, got to be realistic and forthright about it. Awesome. Thanks for your perspective on that. Definitely agree that there's a lot to manage, but getting ahead of it definitely helps. Yeah. Another like question. College, really. <laughs> yeah. Next question from the audience. They wanted to know, how does ethos translate to wins or higher speaker points when all the judges sort of view these things differently? Mm. Yeah, I mean, so that's kind of the weird part of just persuasion and debate in general, right? Like all of us view persuasion, logic, rationality, ethos, pathos, all very differently. But at the same time, at the end of a debate tournament, we kind of have an idea of who the best debaters are. Speaker points tend to coalesce around certain people and they tend to be people that we know are very skilled, right? It'd be very good. Now, in terms specifically of credibility and building up your credibility, that one takes some time. Now you can be like immediately a super great debater. Everybody knows your name. Maybe you've made a bit of a splash. That's so rare though, right? And it's not a very realistic way to think about ethos or credibility in debate. So how do we think about it in terms of coming in as like a frosh, right? Or a sophomore or just anybody on like novice or junior varsity being introduced to debate. What is our credibility there? Well, we listen to our mentors, right? We interact with new people at debate tournaments and interact with them in ways we ask questions and support one another. We work with other teams, right? And that sort of credibility can be built up where then we start debating in round. You read good evidence, you make good arguments, you ask good questions, but you're also respectful and people like you, right? So everybody has their own way of viewing debate and what's credible, but at the same time, there are these ideas and concepts that we all kind of agree on at the same time. And that's why persuasion is beautiful, right? Like there's so many different ways you can do it. it gives us a lot of individual uh, creativity, um, but we need to do things that are objectively credible too. And I mentioned some of them just in this spiel. I mentioned some of them before, you know, you need to dress a certain way. You need to read your evidence in a certain way. You need to flow, you need to listen. And it's really kind of like the mechanics of debate where we start to develop credibility and trustworthiness. Um, like I said, that's a very fundamental sort of baseline part of persuasion and rhetoric. And then from there, we kind of build up with things like logos. If you're credible, then you've got look good logic. If you're credible, then your emotional appeals are based on something more real and credible. So it's almost like kind of we're establishing the fundamentals and the basics of being a good person in and out of debate as part of the community. And then from there, we do the more specific in round kind of acts of persuading people with logic and feeling. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And sort of reflecting on my own judging experience, I definitely see a lot of that um, just sort of in practice. Yeah. Yeah, it's no one thing. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah, doing good every day. Kind of the habit of debate is where you develop ethos. Yeah. Cool. And policy debate often has this sort of perception as being very technical and based in the flow. Um, mm -hmm. When you joined debate, how did you deal with that sort of conception? And how does this idea of like the performative ethos parts of debate sort of, how, how does that look net when? put next to things like the flow of the debate that are very structured and very mm -hmm. sort of on paper. Yeah, so debate is just a very structured activity too. And I, you know, I honestly view it where like performative teams have so much structure too, right? And they have so much structure that's even a lot like a policy debater. Like it follows the same sort of format. Evidence is kind of in the same sort of, like it looks sort of the same, even if it's longer, it comes from different sources and stuff. And, you know, we're all still like at a debate tournament. We still all know the same sorts of terms, but at the same time, it's like flowing is really difficult, but that's kind of like how I think of the world too. So I was a little lucky in that regard where that sort of like flow centric, base it off of the arguments that other people have made in this round in a really technical sort of way. Um, makes a lot of sense to me. But as I'm like saying those things too, right? Like all of that is part of performative debate. So you have to flow no matter the type of debate, but in different debates, the arguments that are important to answer are different. And that's something that I really struggled with because I debated at a time where performance was becoming a much bigger deal, right? Like the 2008 CETA, 
uh, that Joseph mentioned before. I lost to Devin Cooper and his partner at Towson, and it was the first UDL team to win a national championship. And they are pressing debate on its structural racism. Right? And we were at a very <laughs> nascent idea, nascent stage of answering that and everything. So my apologies if anybody goes back and watches that debate. But uh, it's all kind of like you're still debating, right? You still have arguments that people need to respond to, but the things that are important to respond to change. And that's why I think it's important to be able to flow no matter what and flow all sorts of different styles. I mentioned the card drill before, but one thing that was popular at some of the camps I've gone to is listen to a really fast rap song and try to write down every single word that somebody says. Um, or, you know, like the card game is a lot of fun as well, but you got to come up with like, you know, shorthand for flowing no matter what. And everybody's taking notes and you have to answer what people say. So I think there's a big a lot of times there's a big divide put between performance and policy debate, especially in terms of like logic or credibility and how they're structured, but it all kind of sometimes comes down to the same thing too. And just as a personal aside, I think a lot of the policy arguments that are more critical of criticisms um, just maybe even have the logic wrong. Like America has structural racist problems. So pretending like those aren't real, isn't like logical or rational, even though it comes from a philosophical, critical sort of side. Cool. So we've got a couple of questions, some on the debate side, some from your law career. So to keep the, oh, cool. the theme going, <laughs> I'll ask a couple of the uh, debate questions. Some folks were asking, um, what are some ways that uh, you would recommend students practice? So including what you've mentioned, uh, but over the summer, as they prepare for the new season, if they're not able to attend camp in person, uh, considering the situation where a lot of camps that folks might have planned on going to are getting canceled. Um, quick side note, Lambda SDI is not canceled. It will be online. Talk to your coaches. <laughs> um, but yeah, what are some things that you think teams can do uh, in this situation to prepare for the new season? Yeah, you know, so much of the work comes from the off season, really, you know, and it's people that perform super well at the first tournament to oftentimes then have credibility for the rest of the year to be one of those top teams. And, you know, when we were a top team early in the year, <laughs> there were times where we would win debates. Maybe we shouldn't have just because we were the better sort of team. I feel like I've lost some of those debates as well. But something we can do that, how do we build ourselves up over the off season? If we can't go to camp, that's totally fine. I only went to, I went to like one and a half camps when I was in high school. So, so much of it is figuring out how to do it on our own. I think speaking drills, incredibly important and something we can do on our own. You can do what, 15, 20 minutes a day, and that's a ton of speaking drills over the course of the summer. But if we think about it, right, like every debate tournament, we've got, what, an eight-minute speech, a five-minute speech each round, three minutes of cross X, and then we've got at least four rounds of time. So we're speaking over an hour every tournament. So we need to build up the capacity to do that. Speaking drills you can do include speaking as quickly as you can over enunciating every syllable. Do that for three minutes, then do over enunciation three minutes. Try to say a letter such as A or X or S in between every single word um, so that you work on separating outwards. Some people put pins in their mouth, but that gets a little bit slobbery. Uh, something you can do is to hold a chair, right? And hold it against your chest so that you have much better airflow. And then one that I've been experimenting with um, a lot of times we lose breath when we speak quickly because we just try to breathe through our mouths when really we need to breathe more through our bodies, right? And you can practice that ironically by trying to only breathe in through your nose. If you breathe in through your nose, you're not using your throat anymore and you're just using your body to breathe. So those are some different speaking drills you can do. Try to do like three minutes of each of the drills and then be done after 15 or 20 minutes as long as your family's not too annoyed with you. I mentioned some of the flowing drills you could do and maybe you could set up sort of like online, maybe like a Zoom room or something like that where someone can read the playing cards, other people can flow them, and then you can see if that flowing worked out. You can just sort of all, you know, you can practice flowing on your own by trying to just take notes on different things where people speak very quickly. Um, there are a ton of debate lectures right now. There are a ton of really great debates online. Like my videos have all been buried, thankfully, because there are so many great videos for everybody to watch. Practice flowing those. You know, if you can flow those high level, super fast college debates, you're gonna be able to flow much easier in high school debate here at Lambda. Um, then just as part of that, try to just watch debates or read about debate as well. 
Uh, I know a lot of you may try, you know, another thing we do is like research, but I think it's more important uh, at this time and especially over the summer before you go to a camp to just read about debate, read about the theories of debate, the different types of arguments that occur, maybe read some back files about specific arguments to see how they're structured and see how they're set up. The more familiar you are, familiar you are with the arguments and language of debate, the easier it's going to be to really start off hot at the beginning of the year, because um, a lot of people just aren't quite ready yet. So the better you are at the beginning, the better it's going to be throughout the rest of the year. Awesome. And for any students or folks that are tuned in and want access to some of those resources, we're working on compiling some of those videos uh, and articles to read and things like that, both on the topic and the debate theory in general. Uh, some things that go way back to classic debate stuff, to things that are more contemporary and modern. So if y'all are interested in that, let us know right in the chat or email us. Um, we'll mostly be sending it directly to your coaches, but we'll also be sharing it on like our Instagram here on the YouTube and other places. Cool. And then um, one situation that um, a lot of students sort of feel like they run into is they'll have a judge uh, that they believe only votes for certain styles of debate. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you think these things that you're talking about with ethos um, and pathos can translate to try to convince a judge that wouldn't traditionally vote for their type of case or argument? So there, yeah, classic conundrum in debate, you know, how do you appeal to an audience that is hostile to you? And I think the most important part of that, and I don't know, we'll see sort of <laughs> what other components I come up with, maybe it won't be the most important, but the first part of that is to figure out very specifically what the nature of the hostility is. Um, so if someone is not willing to vote for you because you read a performance app, or maybe some judge doesn't like the author that you read, I think it's really important to go beyond that and maybe then speak with that judge more specifically and from a place of respect, calm, kindness, and ask them what they think of your arguments and how you could make them better. Um, you know, you don't have to ask like why we lost, right? Or, you know, what did the other team do? It's like, what are ways that we can do better? And then you can start asking your judge really specifically what the issue is. Because I think a lot of times there's, and I've found this to be true, especially after I've had like a decade or so away from debate and had some time to reflect on some of the relationships I had with judges and other competitors, I misunderstood a lot of times what the hostility was, or it wasn't hostility, it was just miscommunication, or my style didn't necessarily jive with theirs, or just even the way that I spoke didn't fit well with the way they heard things. You know, it could be a million different things and all of it go into why someone doesn't like an argument you like. Now, at the same time, now, if you can get more specific, just sticking with this first point on what the hostility is, then you can be more effective in responding to it. You don't have to get rid of your performance app, but maybe for this judge, you have a advocacy statement that's more like a plan. And maybe instead of explaining your arguments in terms of ontology or epistemology, if you're reading a criticism, you explain them just as sort of like real world impacts, right? Or think terms that make a bit more sense to people. Like everyday violence is a term that makes sense to a lot of people, everyday consequences you know, real life consequences. Find some terms that work beyond just sort of, you know, the terms you know they're, they're hostile to, um, such as performance or ontology. As part of that, and this is the other component, is if you're talking to your judge about ways you can do better, even if the judge doesn't necessarily agree, maybe they are even super hot, maybe they just hate, hate critiques, right? Or they hate performance, they hate poetry uh, in first affirmative constructives and won't ever vote for it. And you know, that happens, but the only way to break that down, I don't think it's super possible necessarily in one round, but it's a process where you debate in front of them in a way where you recognize more explicitly you're trying to persuade the other side. You can say, hey, I know you're not usually persuaded by this, but we believe in it. We think it matters and we're doing our best, you know, change your mind. And we'd love to talk, you know, you can say that in a debate round, try to be as honest with a judge who's maybe hostile to your ideas afterward, because you've built up that ethos, you've built up that baseline of respect, you can talk to them in a more constructive way about building your, up your arguments, but then also start persuading them on the side to think about critiques differently, to think about performance differently. And I personally think judges that are more flexible and more empathetic to what students like to read 
um, just what debaters like to do, make for a better community, make for better judges. So a part of that too is being good debaters who interact well with our judges and teach them too. We don't have as much time to commit to debate as judges as debaters do. So we need help at the same time, it's hard to not be condescending or you know, trying to persuade your judge in, improperly, but you can talk to your judge about arguments you make in a constructive way and try to persuade them and make them think differently as well. But it's a, you know, it's a process. We've all been burned by that before and it's part of debate. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. Like identifying the controversy is so important. It's just funny sometimes thinking about it, like as a judge myself, uh, the, the, the space between how you actually evaluate the round and how students or debaters perceive you as a judge yes. is actually so much smaller um, than they actually think it is. And that, that hill uh, to overcome with that one judge that might not never vote for that type of argument is actually a lot smaller um, than it might be. So even if that judge never voted for a K when you presented it, Maybe it wasn't that they're totally against the argument, but maybe it's there's some tweaking to do there uh, to make it more persuasive for that person. Find a different way to frame it. And then, you know, if you're the person to get them to vote on their first K, that's pretty cool too. And one thing I might mention over the summer too, if people have the opportunity, I didn't say practice debates, you should do practice debates if you can uh, digitally, but even more than that, I, I mean, practice, uh, maybe not more, but judge some practice debates, judge your teammates, try to judge somebody, and you get a much better idea then of what you have to do in a debate round and what it's like to judge. So then you're a much better debater and persuader. Yeah, especially with this new topic, there's so many areas to take it. Practice debates are gonna be the greatest over the summer. I always hated them, but it's because they were the most effective. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So there are some questions that some other folks asked, but I'll save those for our next presenters. Okay. And it looks like we're coming up on four, but thank you, Nate, for your presentation. We always appreciate your support and we look forward to staying in touch as you move back home. Uh, truly my pleasure. Thank you everybody and have a good one.